thank you for just being available. Um, I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of things going on. I don't know everything about you, but uh, I know that uh, Ash Hamilton is a champion of everything that you're doing. And that's, um, he's an amazing person for me to have an amazing contact. And when I hear about um, someone being attached to so many projects um, and doing it grassroots, it just fills my heart. I would love for you to just, uh, if you could, just give like an origin story. Like this is where it started and this is what I want to do. And I definitely want to talk about what um, what you're in right now and what you're punching out. But I mean, did you just wake up one day and you're just like, really, I just want to make stuff so I'm going to do it? Was it tons of rejection? I mean, I'm sure there's lots of people that, you know, would love to, uh, to know where it started. Uh, well, I mean, for me, it, it started um, just with a love of movies. Growing up, I always, I always watched movies, um, mainly horror films. That was that was kind of my favorite genre. I mean, I watched a lot of stuff, but uh, but horror was kind of always what I gravitated towards. Um, so. Later on in life, when I was around, I, was, I, I got into acting. I did drama and theater and things of that nature. Um, and then uh, when I was around 12, I got a video camera, started shooting everything. I mean, it was practically attached to my hand. Um, and I just, uh, you know, I, well, I couldn't not record something. I have hundreds upon hundreds of hours of video of just random things like me and my friends playing games and stuff like that. I mean, none of it's usable footage, but um, I think what it did do is it kind of, it, it over time it honed my ability to begin seeing stories within everyday activities and things of that nature. So um, from that, that's when I was like, oh, I, you know, I'd really like to be a filmmaker. Um, so I started with writing and then, uh, from, from there, um, I got involved in like the video production department in high school and, and that's, that's really when the whole filmmaker part of me took off. And I started every weekend I got with a group of friends and we were doing movies. And of course this was all before the big YouTube boom and, and all that, you know, where you have all these comedy troops and stuff like that. Like that's what m my friends and I did. Um, so uh, I did a, you know, I did a, I continued it on when I, when I went into college, um, I did a, um, I did a couple feature comedies, not, nothing that I would call uh, fantastic. Um, but what ended up happening was uh, I ended up moving to Florida I made a, my first real attempt at a feature, which was a comedy, went to Florida. I ended up getting a job at Universal Studios in the, on, at, from the park side of things, but we shared a production trailer with all, we're like where the producers and the production assistants and, and, and some of those folks were. So uh, I, I, look, I gave them a copy of the movie I made. Looking back on it now, kind of embarrassed that I did because it's awful um, but from that what they said was is they said you know you do have a good eye um, it's obviously a super low budget no budget independent film I don't know how much you'll really be able to do with this um, but but keep your eye on the story because that's really that and the visuals kind of seem to be where um, where you really shine but you need to you need to also look at things from like a marketing standpoint. You need you, you need to make something that that has some maybe mass appeal or something that you know people can gravitate towards um, something a little bit more marketable essentially. So I came I ended up uh, that was 2004. Um, ironically, it was the first really bad hurricane season in like a hundred years, and uh, so we went through four hurricanes. Uh, the fifth hurricane was, you know, category five and, 
uh, destroy the house we were living in, uh, me and my wife. So we came back home, got my job back. I was at a TV station right before I left for Florida. Uh, we were only there for a few months. So the whole thing was kind of, uh, uh, it was kind of all for naught because I planned on going to film school. But when I got back to Owensboro, um, you know, I took my tail between my legs because when I left this place, I, I had that, I was the same atypical filmmaker in the sense where I said, hey, I'm leaving. I'm never coming back. I'm going to go be the next Spielberg. What was the age? Um, this was 2004, no. so I was in my early, I was in my mid twenties. Everybody, that's early twenties. That, everybody does that. It's fine. It's, yeah. yeah. So, and I, you know, so I was gonna run off. I was gonna be the next Spielberg or whatever. And uh, of course, I ended up coming right back home. And this was after this. This was only like four or five months after I told everybody Ouch. I, would, Ouch. I would never come back. Yeah. Um. So as soon as I came back, got my job back at a TV station. I made a second feature, which of course I never really went on to do anything with, but what that whole process instilled in me was I did start looking at things from a more, uh, from a marketing standpoint, like, you know, I started doing more research into, um, you know, equipment and, you know, trying to take what I was doing to the next level as mo as much as I possibly could. Um, but then it wasn't really until 2007 that I got completely fully serious and immersed myself into making independent films and said, okay, look, I'm, I'm, I'm if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right. You know, so I saw it crew. I did actual, I held auditions. Um, you know, I found a location. I worked with special effects artists to do what we needed to do. So, uh, so the first feature I did was called Hallow's Eve, and it's not it's not a fantastic film, um, but I think in a lot of ways, you know, it still holds up. I'm still proud of it. You know, it uh, it's not for the most part. Comedy. It's I mean, it's it's super cheesy in a lot of ways, but it, it was kind of my. Um, I guess it was it was me really <laughs> popping my horror cherry, just you know, because I mean it, it's it's got really over the top special effects for, and we we spent all, we had almost I think we had a thousand dollars for the budget literally that was it. How do you get top notch and special effects with a thousand dollar budget though? You really don't, but I, I think what what uh, what you do is you you say this is how much money I have. But just because you have financial limitations doesn't mean that you have to put crap out. Um, so that's when I really started learning the ability of networking, uh, seeing who all was out there. Now, when I first started doing this back in 2007, I mean, I, I pretty much knew almost nobody that was doing it. I mean, it really it was it was me. As far as like being wanting to direct. Did you make a MySpace um, bulletin? I mean, 2007. That sounds about right. No, this, uh, I think we did have a MySpace page actually. Um, but no, we, we put a casting call out. Uh, Todd Reynolds, who's one of the actors in the film, is a really good friend of mine. Um, that was actually the first time that I, he and I really started working together. But he, he, uh, he runs the local theater workshop of Owensboro. He's the executive director now. Now, um, he came on to help cast because he, he wasn't, running the theater at the time, but he was heavily involved in, in the theater groups and that whole world. So he kind of brought me into that and that's how we ended up doing all the casting is we brought in a lot of those, those people we had, I think it was like 40 auditions total, but for me, it, you know, I felt like a hundred cause I'd never really done the audition auditioning process. Um, so, so anyway, so we ended up, we made the film and, uh, you know, it, it was a lot of trial and error, uh, as, as it is with any, any, uh, any production, but, you know, going back to what you said about, you know, how do you, how do you do something of merit on a thousand dollars? That's where, even though I, I don't, I didn't really give myself a producing credit on the movie. I think that's really when the, the producer side of me really started to kick in because you, you have to start, you know, you have to start, like I said, networking reaching out to people, 
finding those people who are like-minded and passionate about wanting to do the crafts, people who, who are wholly interested in not just the, the idea of making a movie, but actually getting off your ass and making a movie and then getting involved and getting together and, and, and making it happen. So, um, you know, so everything from auditioning and casting to writing the script and, of course, I donned a lot of hats at that time, but I mainly considered myself the writer director on the movie. Um, but so it happened, it got made. Um, it took, we shot, um, five days a week, every week for about two and a half months oh my. to make, to make this film. So you lived and, in, uh, lived in yeah, grief. it was, wow. <laughs> and of course that was, you know, that was strictly out of passion. That wasn't, doing it because I had, I was going to get paid to do it or anything like that. It was, we all, we all had a goal and we set our mind on it. And then we, we saw that goal and we said, Oh, we're going to reach it come hell or high water. And we did. And, um, you know, I'm still really proud of the movie. I mean, there's, there's things about there's, there's the acting is hit can be hit and miss. And, and there's some jokes and things that fall flat because ultimately the movie, it's a slasher film, but it's like a supernatural slasher film. But if you really get to the the meat and bones of it, it's uh it's my adult version of Scooby Doo. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's, so that's, that's awesome. literally what it is because it's about five five ghost hunters that get called into this haunted attraction to solve the mystery of these these uh, unsolved their disappearances at the time, but really their murders. What's the title? And, it's called Hallow's Eve Slaughter on Second Street. Look, I'm actually here on business today. I, that's news you're not gonna like. You know that slaughter has become a cornerstone in this town. You shut it down, there are gonna be repercussions. It's already done. You see, what I did after we talked was to call up a group of paranormal investigators. They're gonna come out tomorrow night and have a look at the place. We need this investigation a lot more than they need us. Uh, Our credibility is on the line this time. Uh, We've already spent the last of the petty cash uh, on this trip, so after tonight, we might all be looking for new jobs. No white house on a hill of mud. Uh, hey there, y'all. Buckmasters, a proud owner and operator of Slaughter on Second Street. Well, we had a couple of kids finishing up just behind the hallway over there. And, uh, well, our security guard had stepped out to take care of some business. When he come back, uh, what he found was enough to make him quit. What did he find? You want the real story. The tragedy took place within the walls of these forsaken grounds. The suffering that dwells in this place it has been to hell and back. What's going to happen in here tonight? Something bad. At no time is anyone to be left alone. All you have to do is remember our creed. A night of fright is no delight. The evil in this place, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. What kind of evil? We're all going to die. We found one of the volunteers. She's dead. Lock this door behind and make sure nobody gets out. Make sure you know what you're doing. Hope you can't get out. Well, then I'll be right back. I can't sit in here all night. This place is a death trap. For God's sakes, people out there are dying, and I don't want to be next. Ghosts don't kill people. Are you willing to stick around and find out? The only way we're going to get out of here alive is to split into two groups and look for a way out. You can calm down. Tell me what is going on. My friends are in there, and they're dying. I'm not going to sit around here and watch everybody get picked off one by one. Sounds like we're going to get picked off in tidy little groups to me. series of the original Scooby-Doo cartoons and That's took awesome. notes. A little bit of research. Over... Casey Kasem hung out yeah, with them for exactly. a little bit, that right? Was, yeah. Was like, that was, 
you know, the, the Chevy and Doobie were the two stoners. Absolutely. And Frank and Alma and Stephanie were the other three. So, yeah, so it was very much Scooby-Doo. Um, did anyway, anyone make that, that parallel is, for you, though? Sorry to talk over, but did anyone make that parallel for you? Or were you just unapologetic, like, no, this is it. That's what it is. Oh, no, that's that was my intention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, went in, I went into it um, saying this is going to be my – No, well, I'll, I'll say this. I didn't necessarily come out and tell anybody else. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Um, you know, even, even in the – mark, like the later on in the marketing and, and getting the movie out there, I never said, oh, it's Scooby-Doo. I right. let everybody who watched it kind of figure that out themselves and i think that's part of why so many people did have fun with the movie because it is a fun movie but there are a lot of like technical issues and things of that nature there's a few plot holes and whatnot but you know it was our it was my first real big attempt at trying to do something and uh thankfully it it you know it panned out but uh it's it's also the, the very first review that i got for it was also one of the worst reviews that I've ever gotten for any of my projects. And to the point where I can even like, it, it really did. It hit me hard. Cause I thought, Oh God, you know, it's, it's already over with before it really began. But I mean, it made comments that I can remember to this day. Which may, are I, like, may I ask, was it honest and brutally honest or was it just like over the top? Somebody's upset with what you're doing. No, it was uh, it was someone who really hated movies. That's and it was that's, one of those. It was yeah, it wasn't constructive in any way. That's my I question. Because really, if it's constructive and you did something that you're just like, I poured my heart out of this, and somebody just, um, you know, and I we we haven't. I, I guess going to make this point. We haven't um, hit any uh, expletives. Being a podcast video, um, I'm going to keep it as clean as I can. Because I, I did a, um, I'm partnering with a comic shop, and Comic Fest is coming up very soon for Halloween. So um, I, I censored myself before saying it. You haven't said anything either. So let's just go the, we're halfway through. Normally, this closures go at the beginning. Um, but was it someone that just kind of, uh, I, I was wondering if someone just crapped on the idea because of um, definitely projection rather than being constructive. Um, but now that you're just come out and said, like, no, we just hated movies. Like, wow, that, there's no need for that. Please continue. Oh no! It, um, yeah, it was one of those reviews where I mean, it, it it doesn't say this, but it's pretty obvious by the time it's over with. It's saying this movie has no merit whatsoever. There was nothing constructive about it, yeah. and you know, for me, be, that being my first outing, it was tough. It was tough because I didn't, I, I wasn't used to that. I was, I was new to the game, so I wasn't real familiar with. I wasn't familiar with haters which you know are now trolls back then oh, they sure. were just yeah. mean, mean critics um so you know and it, i mean it would say things like uh, uh quirky music and lots of blood do not make you quentin tarantino ouch yeah so so obviously that stuck with me um now but I, I think what I was able to do was is, is once the, the good reviews started coming in, and then there's the lukewarm reviews, the sure. ones that are constructive, they give the good with the bad, you really kind of, you, you begin to grow a thick skin, especially over time. Sure. Um, so so that like I said, that was my very first movie. But what it did do was um, it, it did two things for me when I that especially that first really bad review. It, it did make me start to kind of question, like, can I do more than blood and gore? So I kind of set myself on this path to prove not just to myself, but to some of these other critics, you know, that that I was more than just goofy one liners and uh, and, and blood and guts. Um, and then it did kind of and, and, and it made me go, OK, well, I'm going to try my hand at something a little different. So. So the next project I did was a short film because I did it in reverse instead of making a, you know, instead of going the, uh, you know, the saw route where it's two people in a room for 80 minutes. The main cast for Hallow's Eve was, uh, it was like 10, but I think there were 17. Wow. Total that's a lot cast. of actors. Wow. And, and it was, you know, it was an hour and a half long movie. So on my second film, I did, you know, a short film. It's 19 minutes, and it's the cast has three people in it. 
but it ended up being a psychological drama. And it's called A Mind Beside Itself. And you can act. I was just dating. What about? You, of course. I bet you say that to all the girls you dream about. No. With you, I mean it. Unless you're absolutely opposed to it. Maybe you'd want to move in with me. You're serious. With all my heart. feel special. I try. I don't understand what you want. What I want is for you to stop wandering off into your own little world. You are my world. You're all I think about. Ever since you stopped taking your medication, you've been becoming more and more like some other person. get on uh, online and find it I put the whole thing online um, but it's it's a psychological drama it's um, you know there's no there's no blood there's no I, I did have one shot where I wanted to add blood but my wife was the production manager and she pulled me aside while we were trying to test some of the blood and she said look you're trying to prove to yourself and others that you can do stuff without blood so take blood out of this so I nixed the blood, and I think it ended up, uh, it helped create, you know, the atmosphere I was looking for without having the, the, the blood element in there. Um, but what I found with doing A Mind Beside Itself was, um, you know, while it's a psychological drama, and it's got the, you know, it's got the story, and the acting was pretty solid, and and it was written, um, I don't want to really give anything away, no, but, no, it, you know, it's don't. written. Yeah. You know, it's like all the dialogue is kind of double-sided. It, it's saying one thing, and it's it's really got this going on. So when you finally come around to the twist in the end, it, it all really makes sense, especially once you watch it on the second go-around. But, um, you know, I, it played at festivals. It got like five reviews, but they were all glowing. I mean, one of, one of them was so good. I mean... It's one of those ones that you read and you're like, I, I don't really know if they watched the, the movie I sent That's them. Because awesome. you would have thought that like Christopher Nolan had made it or That's something. Awesome. It was just, it, it felt too much. But they enjoyed it and that's what matters. But um, but yeah, so, but what the other thing it did for me was, is after I made a psychological drama, I said, you know, I had fun making that movie, but I, I didn't have as much fun as when I did horror like a horror film and so i knew that whatever i did next it i was going to go back into horror um so then uh and th and this is and th this is something else that uh that I've, I've noticed some filmmakers this goes into my the one part of my making films where it it was you know i made the a major mistake and i kind of pigeonholed myself there for a while and that was came up with this idea and you know I, I still to this day I love the concept I co-wrote the script with another director and um, I said this is what the next movie is going to be and at that point I'd done Hallow's Eve and it was hit and miss I did A Mind Beside Itself it had some really good reviews um, I was still kind of learning the whole marketing and promoting angle but I was getting really I was getting better at it and I was really kind of gaining some momentum there with gaining contacts and that, that sort of thing. 
so when the time came to, to do this next project, I kind of put the cart before the horse. I went out and I shot a, a like a teaser trailer that really seemed to get everybody excited. And then, uh, and then the movie didn't happen because I couldn't get the financing for it. Oh, damn. Oh, so wow. I had a few other things that I was dabbling in. Yeah. Was I I started a film festival locally and that actually had panned out. So I did a film festival uh, for about four years. That's so awesome. I, I'd started a film festival here in Owensboro, yeah. and it it worked out like we. We started out at the mall, and then we ended up we ended up going into the uh, local convention center. Once it got much much bigger, twenty fourteen was actually the last year that we had it, and Peter Weller was our big oh, name wow. that we had, which wow. was he was super awesome. But yeah, um, but what ended up happening was is so that movie that movie didn't happen, and. I there for a very short period of time, I became one of those filmmakers where it's like, oh, well, he says he's going to make a movie, but then he's not going to make the movie. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that sucked. Um, that makes you work harder so though, right? Kind of, do what? That makes you work harder though, right? I mean, now you have to produce well, something. Right. And, and that's, and that's the other thing. It's like, I'm not afraid of failure. Um, I know a lot of people that are, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that I've talked to over the years that, um, it's their fear of failing, which is why they never actually take that first step to get out there and, no, and make absolutely. something happen. And, yep. and I'm, I don't know if maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm too stupid or too passionate no, about too it. Too passionate. Like, it's like, yeah. cause people, you know, there was a guy that I was working on with the festival when we first started it and he was like, well, what if, you know, what if, what if it falls apart? What if this happens? What if that happens? And I was like, you know, so what, you know, then we, we do something different. We yep. reinvent ourselves. Or, yep. you know? So, so even, even though there for a while I was, you know, for a very short period of time, I was kind of known as that guy who said he was going to make a movie and didn't make a movie. Well, yeah. Um, I, I ended up digging myself out of the hole, but the other thing I did was is that I completely got away from from what my, my true passion was, which was making films, and I got heavily involved in the film festival. And then I came up with this other concept for a, a an event called Unscripted. And I went to the local library, and I pitched them the concept. The concept for Unscripted is it's – uh, tailored to short films, and it was a way for local and regional film fe- uh, filmmakers who had, excuse me, who had a short film. They could come, and they, you know, it was it was a, a venue to where they could screen their film. But the the catch was, uh, what made it different was that they sit down and they show the film. They do a very very brief Q and A, and then they show the film a second time. That's awesome. But what they do during the second showing is they go and they sit with the audience and they hold a live interactive audio commentary that's experience. Amazing. It's like a DVD. Yeah, that's amazing. They, yeah. So it's cause I was, you know, I'm a big fan of DVD commentaries. And one night I was thinking, yeah. how cool would it be to be sitting right next to the director yeah. and letting, you know, them talk about it right next to me. And if I knew what they were already talking about, I could interrupt and say, well, what about this? And so I pitched the library, this idea for unscripted. They loved it. Yeah. And then, so they greenlit the first series, which went for, it went, it went for six weeks. Oh my gosh. Um, so one Saturday, you know, or every Saturday for six weeks. And, um, I didn't know if it was going to go over. I didn't know how it was going to, you know, how it was going to pan out, but it ended up being super successful for them. I mean, by the second weekend, they had over 80 people show up and that was unheard of uh, to the point where they weren't prepared for that many people. So they had this like backup kind of a filler room and uh, they weren't even, they didn't think they'd ever have to use it, but that night they did. So so by the time the six before the six weeks was over with, they were like, we want to do this again. So they ran it again. Uh, um, and we, I ended up coming up with this idea to where we could, uh, you know, we, we did like a, uh, 
like a charity event where we raised money, using it to raise money for uh, for lymphoma and stuff like that. So, um, so by the, I think they they ended up liking it so much they ended up green lighting the second series with within the same year. So then I went had to go out and find more filmmakers and we did it again. It was still, it went really, really well. And, um, they said, all right, you know, we let's, they said, this is going way better than we ever anticipated. We love it. We should do something more with the program. So we kind of co collaborated on this idea of doing essentially what is called the unscripted film school. And what that did was that brought in two, independent local independent filmmakers and on one night they would shoot films simultaneously in the library on the first floor and the second and we opened up this registration where people from the community could get online they could register for the program and then they would be able to come on set and see what it was like to make an independent film so you could be immediately if you're interested in that a part of the process you just broke down so many walls you just brought it you broke down so many walls and you brought it to the forefront and this is where your uh, previous marketing insecurities just must have melted away because I, I've never heard of something like this being done and uh, you can't see my hands but if you did if you take notes you're like oh my gosh this is an amazing idea like I can't believe it's just I, I don't know what the community in your area is like um, if it's a thriving art community, but even if it's not, that still gets people out of their comfort zone and it gets people that uh, have been working so long on these ideas to share it. And, and I just, I love collaboration and that's, wow, that's just awesome. Uh, it was, I mean, it, it shocked me. I mean, this, yeah. when I did Hallow's Eve, like I said, when I did Hallow's Eve, there was, I didn't know anybody who was doing this. Um, I didn't have the, I didn't have a whole lot of connections. I didn't know a whole lot of uh, creatives or artistic individuals that were interested in, in doing this and shared the same amount of passion that I yeah. did. After Hallow's Eve, the floodgates kind of opened up and that really is where I started get, gaining a lot of those connections locally, like Evansville, Indiana is a real big arts community that's recent or that, that's local. And of course you have like uh, Louisville and Lexington. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so, so by the time Unscripted come around, I, I mean, I, I you know, I, I had fallen on my face and I'd kind of dug myself out and I really didn't know if Unscripted was going to pan out and it did. Um, but what ended up happening was, so we did the, the film school, the Unscripted film school, and it went incredible. I mean, it went incredibly well. The library got tons of publicity. Actually, uh, PBS came out. Oh my god! And that's did awesome. yeah. So they they ended up doing a piece on on me and on unscripted and yeah. And you know, of course, the library was like, "Oh my god, we gotta we gotta keep this thing going." Yeah. So so they said uh, they they came to me almost immediately after the the first unscripted film school installment had happened, and they said, "All right, we want to do the unscripted film school." Again, but we want to uh, we want to do something different. Come up with an idea. Oh wow! And no pressure. At right? this point, yeah. At, th- at this point, I, had, I I was no longer at the TV station. I had to get a real job sure. uh, to pay the bills. Gotta so keep I was up working appearances. Do what? Gotta keep appearances. You know. Yeah, I, yeah. How old but, are uh, you, by the way? How old am I? Yeah. Uh, Thirty-five. Okay. See that I'm I'm trying to put out the point and and uh, amplify it that um, our generation doesn't have the option of lying of relying on one uh, position one job one uh, base of income so that does not surprise me um, I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of narrative back and forth about how uh, our generation I'm 34 so our, our generation um, you know wants different things but like we're doing work while you're asleep. Like, I mean, while, while other people, they, they punch out at five, but people that are passionate and creative, uh, we don't stop until, you know, three thirty, four o'clock in the morning and we'll get up and do it again because it's, we have to, we don't know a different way. So no, I yeah. completely understand. Well, I had, you know, and there was a, when I, when I started the factory job, um, cause I was, I worked in the fact, I went to a factory, which sucked. And I sure. always said I would never do, I would never work in a factory cause I knew being creative that it was, it was going to kill me because I wasn't going to have that ability to be creative. 
Um, so when I start, when I did start working at the factory, I had the film festival. This was pre unscripted. Um, so when I first got in there, I mean, it was, it was, it was, uh, you know, I was at work by 5 a.m. I got off at 3 30, but it was so mind numbingly dull and just, I don't know. It's, I mean, it wasn't hard work, but it was just really like, it was, it was, it was soul sucking. So, you know, cause sure. you go, I, I, I was so used to going into a place of work where they expected you to be better today than you were yesterday. Like, to, because you knew some, some extra skills Absolutely. or you learned something that brought something that much more to the table. Sure. And then I went to this factory where they don't care if you're alive or dead, just as long as you show up and stand at a table and sort emblems, that's all that matters. Right. So then I would leave at the end of the day and I was just so completely down. Um, but what ended up happening was, so I got, so at that point, you know, like, go ahead a little bit into it. My soul was pretty much gone at work, sure. but I did have unscripted and that, you know, that kept me going. And I'm pretty sure I had ADD when I was younger. Of course, that was before ADHD. Oh, absolutely. And I'm pretty sure I have um, adult ADHD I, now. I think it's passion. I really do. Um, because I Passion have, and adult ADHD. Well, I, I have conversations a lot, and um, I've just decided in the last couple of years to revisit formal education. I always had uh, problems um, in uh, previous years, and I actually developed this. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to say like quite hostility, but definitely um, it did not care about formal education. Like I will reverse engineer and find a better way to do it. And now I'm learning with new professors that. There is something that I um, I don't like the the stigma or the label of ADHD, but I definitely have some type of um, trait, or characteristic, or even bonus feature. I'll call it a bonus feature because I don't want uh, I don't want to uh, I want other people that hear this to be like wait 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 no 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 I've got something extra not that I have a disability and I, I'm aware of it like I have something and I'm, and talking to a lot of professors and I'll turn in work two weeks ahead of time. And they're like, why is this, why are you doing this? Like, what is, what is the problem? Like, there's, there's no problem. I just have so many things going on. And even when we got to talk, like I was reaching out to you, multitasking, living in these very short windows of people. And I think it's passion. I don't think it's ADHD or, or ADD. Um, I'll call it a bonus feature. You call it what you want, but I don't think that we'd get the content out of um, artistic people if they weren't passionate and they didn't have that extra energy. And it's, it's almost like a video game. you got a bonus life. Like you just, you know, you have more than others and you push it as far as you can because you know, there's always going to be something extra. So I All hope right. that I, I hope that I encourage you to do that as well. Just know you don't have ADHD. You have a bonus feature. Like you were programmed in a way to operate because if you did have the, you, you punch in and you punch out, you know, five to three, then you get to run and you get to play in your own video game. I, I feel like my whole life is a video game. I do. Um, and it's like, okay, so you beat this level and everyone else is content just playing at that level and that's fine. They can walk around and their avatar can be within uh, one level for, for their entire, um, you know, for their entire job. But for me, it's like, I got to see what's next. I got to open the door. I got to step up to the, to, uh, to stairs. I got to find an Easter egg. I've got to do more stuff. And I'm, I'm hoping that's what right. that film school was for you as well. So. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because there were, um, especially after Unscripted took off, there, there were guys that I worked with that, you know, I would come into the break room and they're like, oh, PJ's in the newspaper again. You know, and they would ask, they, they would be like, why don't, why don't you just, why don't you just go home and just sit down and watch TV? You know, why? Do you, and I'm, and I would ask how, and there's nothing wrong with this, but right. I would say, how Absolutely. are you content yeah. with just wanting to go home and watch TV and veg and sure. not do anything else. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I mean, there's absolutely nothing no, wrong with that. No, Honestly, not, yeah, no, not at all. I wish sure. that I had yeah. the ability to sh just shut yeah. my brain oh, off, absolutely. go yeah. home and not do anything. But oh, even, yeah. you know, even when I'm sitting there watching, uh, <laughs> I'm way behind, but like we just joined Netflix. Mm -hmm. We've been watching the new uh, the new season of Supergirl. <gasps> Steal my heart, love it, love it. I, I do. I, all those all those DC shows. Oh, it's just, 
We are a Marvel so family, right. but we welcome the DC or say the DC universe for CW. We welcome that into our home with with open arms. Uh, it is yeah. my wife and I. It is a ritual for us. We have different schedules, so whatever time that we have, we only have an hour. We're going to watch uh, Supergirl, Flash, and and we love those shows. So I that's that's amazing. Like it's uh, we we got to watch the pilot a couple years ago at uh, Wizard World. And I just lost my mind because all of my friends at the time had young girls and there had never been anything that they could grab onto. And I was like, this is awesome and I'm so stoked. So sorry to run over it, but I, I share the love and affection oh, for it just the same. <laughs> and you, so, you know, that's, yeah, that's, um, I, you know, I was never a, uh, I was never a big fan of, of Superman growing up. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I always gravitated towards, like, Batman or, you know, the, for the, those DC characters, you know. Yeah. And then, but even then, I was never a huge comic book fan or anything like that. But now, um, I just am constantly consuming these these comic book shows, and comic book movies, and pretty much comic book everything. And the funny – and the other thing, too, is I guess probably part of it is Kevin Smith is kind absolutely. of uh, – absolutely. He's he's been a big influence on my my style of writing and that kind of thing. So Absolutely. so I think too, like seeing his interest in it has piqued my interest a lot more in uh, in, in in that whole world. So but yeah, so we've been but he, basically the reason I even brought that up is because like even if I'm watching a show like Supergirl or you know or whatever it is, um, I'm, my mind is still going. I'm constantly thinking about all these other projects or potential projects or, you know, like somebody I just met or I'm networking with or I'm talking to and what the potential is there for not just friendship, but just, for you know, what could happen in the future. So, so that's, so, you know, even, even though I worked at this, was working at a, uh, at a factory that I just absolutely hated. And I, you know, I, 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 sometimes I just wanted to go home and not do anything, but I had so many, you know, so many things going on and unscripted was happening and, and all that. So long story short, what happened with like this, and this actually leads you can up do to long like, story long. I got time. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> I'm here to talk to you. I have paused everything to hang out with you. So you don't have to do long story short. That's the amazing thing about technology, about the way that we live. I am at my house hanging out with you. Don't let this fool you. There's a laundry room back there, okay? But I just want to be able to drop your logo behind it. So that's how I feel. So please, I'm here to hang out with you. Everything stopped. Unless I get a text from my wife and she freaks out saying this, that, or the other, we're good. But she's at the gym. We're good. I was gonna say, unless she comes in and has to do a load of laundry. No, you are no, 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 no. She's at the gym. She's good. We're good. No, no. We, um, uh, okay. Well, then, long story long. Awesome. There you go. Um, so we did uh, so? So we, you know, we did the first uh, installment of the unscripted film school, and I'm still working at the factory. The library comes to me and says, "I want you to." Uh, I want you to come up with another idea, something, you know, where's the next place we can take this, this, the film school? Cause we want to do it again. And at that point I, I had not done a film in a while, in a long while. And I had been doing so many, um, I'd been doing so many events. I kind of felt like an like a glorified wedding planner or something like, cause I, I love that I you say that. I, had, I love that you what? say that. I, I love that you say that. And let me ask how you feel because how long have it been since you made a film? Two years, three years? Well, I mean, are you talking about before volumes of blood? Yes. Leading up, like after this film school, like at leading up to, cause that's where we're going. I no spoiler alert. Right. But yeah. So it'd been three years, maybe. Yeah, it was about three and a half years. Because my question is, I love going and being a part of uh, – th this year it worked hard enough to get uh, recognized as press for Wizard World. Uh, I'm going to apply for, for the rest. I'm just – it's a baby steps, bottom of the pyramid. I love to go to engage with everyone, but I also look at some folks that have been playing that one card for a little too long. And the fact that you realize three years is a long time, that's amazing. I – 
I would love to encourage others not to rest on, on what they did, but to move forward in what they're doing. And that's amazing that you're only three years into it and you're like, no, no, I got to do something. I got to do something. I can't just be the guy of the last thing. So, well, it's, I mean, that's, it, it wasn't necessarily, I, I guess there, there was the bit of the defeatist side of me that I tried to make a film and it didn't pan out. And I kind of fell into that, that category of guys wanting to make a movie, but didn't, I bounced back, but I bounced back with a film festival. I bounced back with, um, uh, with unscripted at this point, I also got in, uh, there, I don't know if you're familiar with Scarefest out of Lexington. No, I was, can, uh, drop it. That's the magic they're technology. Having, they're having year 10. They're, they're having their 10th year this year and they're having like Robert England and all these oh, nightmare wow. on Elm street, That's awesome. uh, reunions and things. So yeah, it's, it's gotten really big, but what happened was because I was doing a film festival that actually led into me helping co-coordinate their film festival with them. So, so yeah, so it wasn't, so, you know, I was doing my film festival here. I was doing unscripted. Mm -hmm. I was doing scare fest. I was, or I was helping with uh, scare fest film festival. And I mean, I had a few little projects here and there, but it was like, uh, you know, I did, um, there was a local WBKR, which is a local radio station had a, a zombie run and they wanted, I was known as the horror guy because yeah. that's kind of the main Absolutely. thing that I was, I would get involved with that type of thing. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I got involved with other people's projects, helping out in various capacities and stuff. Uh, I, I helped with a, a short film called bloody hooker, bang, bang. That's an and, amazing title. Uh, then, <laughs> I don't care what it's about. That is a winner. I do not care what it's about. And it's, uh, it's, no, it's it's a fun short, and I I, you know, I was only there actually for one day, but, sure. but it, it was a lot of fun to work on that. And, um, you know, there was a few other projects. I want to call this episode "Bloody Hooker Bang Bang," but it's not your property. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's somebody else's baby, but I still had my hand in it. That's crazy. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. But if, so what happened was is there was um, there's a group of guys that uh, that I been working with or associated with and we at one point in that three and a half years we had tr we tried to get together and come up with a anthology project but nothing ever coalesced and that fell to the wayside so what happened was when the library came to me and said hey we want to do the unscripted film school again come up with an idea I kind of already knew what I wanted to do. I thought, all right, this is the perfect opportunity awesome. yeah. for an anthology. Absolutely. So instead, I went to I went to my crap job at the factory, and instead of actually working, I, I literally spent that eight hours mapping out the anthology, and I was like, all right, the whole thing's going to take place at um, you know the library, and then because of that, I started thinking of. I love nuances and I love play on words and I love meta type stuff. So that's where I came up with volumes of blood. Mm, absolutely. So, yeah. Was, yeah. So that yeah. was the title from day one. And, and, you know, I, I knew I wanted the, the main story to be centered around this guy who was trying to come up with a, a, you know, his thesis on urban legends and how to create a new urban legend and make it perpetuate. And that's how the stories would come into place. Um, so, so, so I came up, I spent an entire eight hour work day doing that instead of actually working. Um, know. Went to the library. <laughs> I, I went to the library, I pitched them that idea. Jim Blanton was the name of the guy who was running the library at the time. He was a big horror fan. Um, and he loved the idea. So I was like, yeah, so now instead of doing, um, instead of doing like two short films simultaneously on one night, what if we shoot a series of short films over a period of time and they all coalesce into making awesome. a feature film? Yeah. And they're all interconnected by this one uh, location, which would be the library. Yeah. And so, you know, so then I set out getting, you know, with uh, set out, getting with writers and of course this it was easy finding the directors because I was able to, to contact 
my friends and some of the other guys that we would wanted to work together, but we never really had an opportunity. Like Nathan Thomas Milliner, he's an artist. He's he's done some stuff for Scream Factory and Horror Hound and NECA. And uh, so, yeah, so like he, we had been wanting an excuse to work together on something and that gave us the excuse that we needed. Um, so that that's literally the genesis of, of where Volumes of Blood came from. And of course, when, when I sat that, you know, at that eight hours in that factory coming up with the idea, I mean, never in a million years did I think that it would eventually become a, you know, a trilogy or it would get the accolades that it's gotten. I mean, all that was just, you know, icing on the cake. It, a lot of it was done out of just almost for me a necessity to get back in the saddle and make another movie. Even if I did direct a sequence on the first film, I wrote the first film, but I mainly produced the first movie. Um, so, so that was, that volumes of blood was really a, an excuse to work with a lot of these people that I've been wanting to work with and B just make a movie after so long. And it just, it had been such a long, I know three and a half years probably for some people doesn't seem like a long no, time, but when no. you're, your hands are tied you know, forever. yeah, when you're a creative person, yeah. it, that's, it feels like three and a half lifetimes that have gone by when you haven't made something that's kind no, of your absolutely. own. That's yeah. so, so that's kind of, so that's, that's basically where volumes of blood came out. It was just this, necessity to make something and, and just, you know, direct again, to write again. I'm studying urban legends and sociology. Each one of us will take turns creating an original legend. When all's said and done, we'll be remembered forever. No one gets remembered if they don't try. You look a little bit tired. I've been up for the past two days with only six hours of sleep. What if I could give you something that would give you the biggest rush of energy you've ever had? term tomorrow in my urban legends class. Well, I guess it means a party's out of the question then. Which part gave it away exactly? You gonna be okay all by yourself in the dark and scary library? I'm a final girl at heart. I thought I knew every book in the place, but I've never seen this one before. What's it called? The Encyclopedia Satanica. This book claims that it can allow a person to speak with the dead. Try to speak to the dead using a book that's devoted to Satanism. And on Halloween of all nights. found a new home. For the equipment, I want to get into the, a little bit of a nerdy um, equipment questions just off the top of my head. Now, um, you mentioned Kevin Smith. I say it every chance that I get. Smartphones, the camera is more sophisticated than what he had to make clerks. So there's no excuse for people not to make something. I mean, it's there. It's in your pocket. Um, for you, for your tech, um, do you lay out a budget and we're going to rent all this stuff? Do you own your gear? Where does that start? Well, with like, well, I mean, with Volumes of Blood, um, it was we didn't really have a budget for the first film. Um, a majority of, of what you would consider costs for a budget were kind of already taken care of, especially with, you know, the... Um, with the location and things of that nature, we, we did have a budget 
and I'll go, it was six six thousand dollars was the budget for the first volumes of blood but a majority of of the major expenses were kind of already covered um the the biggest i knew going into it because i'm a big gore hound and 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 that you know i like stories and characterization and everything but also if i'm i'm a big slasher fan so i knew that when we did this like there was uh the, the wraparound story dealt with a killer in a mask. So I, so I really wanted to put all the, the resources that we could into the special effects to make the kills as elaborate and visceral as we possibly could. We, of course we had to cheat because there's 19 deaths in the movie, but there's 13 on screen kills. Wow. A lot of, but you know, I I still like now when I, now if I watch the film, I still feel like I cheated myself because, you know, of course we had to allocate money to other areas. Sure. Um, but so some of the kills ended up having to happen off screen, and you see a blood splatter on the wall or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, as far as I had never budgeted before, so that was all kind of new. I I never really dealt with a budget to be entirely honest with you. Um, and the, you know, I, I know you gotta, you know, they say you gotta spend money to make money, but that's not my drive. Making money is not my sure. drive. I mean, yeah. I like money. Yeah. Money does make the world go round. You have to pay your bills, but yeah. when you're really, really, truly passionate about something, you're going to do it whether you get paid or not. Oh, and I know there's I people out there that say, well, don't, if you do something good, you don't do it for free. Well, here, here's what I've learned. Unless you work in the industry and you're, you know, if you're, if you're JJ Abrams or you're Johnny Depp or you're Spielberg or something like you're Tom Hanks, you are set. But if you're working in the indie sector, if you're working at, you know, my level and you get into this saying, well, I'm not going to do anything unless it comes with a payday. You're really probably you're you're unless you're as good as Tom Hanks, you are not going to see a lot of action. Sure, you're not going to you're not going to get to play a lot. And for me, it's not about the money; it's about getting out and working with others and being creative and collaborating, and it, the process of making something happen. For me, that's what it's about. You know, because I. At one time, I had these big aspirations. I was going to run out, and I was going to be the next Spielberg. And I'm sure there's, you know, there's still people out there that are doing that, and that's fine, um, because one idea eventually takes you to the next. Um, I'm not working in the industry, but I'm very content with where I'm at and what I'm doing and what I have done and where I'm planning on being in the next ten to twenty years. And if that takes me to the industry where I'm suddenly working in Hollywood then, or, you know, then that that's great. But honestly, I don't have any desire to live in New York or live in LA or even live in Atlanta. And, you know, I think you know, if, for people who want to do that, that's great. But for me, I prefer driving from one side of town to the next in 15 minutes. Sure. I don't like sitting in traffic. Yeah. And I can still make movies and do things here and not have to go to those places. But it's a matter of making it happen where you're at. And, you know, I, I think at one time, if you wanted to do this and you wanted to be a part of this, you had to go to those places. There wasn't, there wasn't any other, any other choice. Right. But now going back to what you said, creative people are everywhere. Yep. And thank, thankfully because of social media, Absolutely. We're all more easily accessible, and now we Absolutely. know where where each other is at, for good or for bad. And well, you know, you can you can find people with the right equipment. So yeah, can't you, you just can, we transfer some files and say, "Will you edit this for me? I can't right now, two gig at a time, and then send it back." I mean, you can have an editor anywhere in the world, and that's what makes it amazing. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm just excited about the fact that, and then that's the thing, like the creative thing. It's um. We see the we see the, the internet as a tool, as a connection tool, rather than um, we don't have limitations anymore because it's available. And um, I, I didn't get a chance to ask, but I'm hoping this is correct. Um, the Owensboro, right? That's that's where you currently are. Are you from Owensboro? Yeah, that's and yep. and that's what I was I was hoping because um, 
a part of the brand of, of what I do, um, and this is like a spinoff series of the original brand, um, but it'll be under there anyway. It's whatever marketing, you understand it. It's, um, but I take people with me wherever I can digitally. Um, I know that there's people that work in the factories. I know that there's people that are, and, and I, 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 um, I don't say it so quickly to be uh, belittle anything or make it sound like a script, but I know the guys that are stocking shelves, changing tires, cleaning toilets. I, I, I know these people that are out there doing this stuff, and I've worked many, many jobs in my life just to stay creative, and it feels amazing to be able to connect with those people and say, hey, I get to be part of this awesome thing today, and I'm going to take you with me. And, um, and it's, it's all people from my hometown, so you just showing me that – it's possible to shoot even further on, on a bigger scale than what I'm doing right now is that's why we're talking, man. It, it's, and it's, it, it's, um, how do I say when, when I build something and I build a platform and the brand is all about highlighting local people, that is amazing. And that's the mission, but you're doing the same thing that I'm doing just on a grander scale. And I want to show people that it's possible and it's just, it's awesome. It really is. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I appreciate you bringing me on the show. Yeah, you know, no, was... having me be having me be a part of this because it's just, I mean, back when I did this, when I first started doing this, opportunities like what we're doing right now, they they, they didn't exist. Um, but and you know, the technology and and the the the, the ability to connect and be connected with other creative people has, has, has expanded so much. Sure. Um, you know, like I said, for good and for bad. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's people who are doing it and really passionate about it. And of course you have the people who, you know, who, who think that just because they have a camera, they can be a filmmaker. And I guess in some, in some degree they can be, but there is a lot more to it than that. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, as far as, uh, getting your, your films and your projects out there and, and having the right people see it or find it in a lot of ways um, has gotten a little tougher for those people to find your films or to be discovered if you, if you know, if uh, because there's so much to sift through and the, the market has really, especially in the horror division has become really oversaturated with all types of, of projects and uh, it's, you know, it's exciting and it's weird and it's just, it's, it's just been, I think overall it's been just a very surreal experience uh, doing this. And, and, you know, for me, it's, it, you know, and I, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, I have been saying I, I, I a lot, but ultimately what it really comes down to is through everything I've done, it was never just me. I always had somebody there that was right beside me or helping me, whether it was my wife, Katrina, um, you know, or some of my past colleagues. Um, you know, I've had some falling out with people and sure. stuff like that, but, but, um, you know, even, even working with those individuals, it's still built up to something. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, like volumes of blood, and I say this with any interview or whatever that I do, it may have started with me, but it always ended with everyone else That's because, awesome. yeah. I mean, awesome. there was over a hundred people involved in making that movie. And, you know, you, you watch a movie and you say, oh, there's Steven, Sp I bring this guy's name up a lot. There's Steven, Sp that's Steven Spielberg's movie. But like Volumes of Blood is not a PJ Starks movie. And the reason I look at it that way is because it's it's not. It's it's so many different people coming together for one goal, being like minded, loving what they're doing. Sure. You know, like I said earlier, seeing that 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 light at the end of the tunnel, yeah. and then you know getting together and wanting to make something cool, wanting to do something. Um, so for me, that's really what it's about. Like, you know, if, if, if whatever I do next turn, you know, turns into some gigantic million dollar franchise, then that's fantastic. That, that's great. But if it doesn't, that's great too. 
and I'm I'm content with that. I'm okay with that because I mean it's I've met so many amazing people and done so many incredible things. You know where I'm at. I'm just some guy in Middle America. I'm, I mean I'm 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 nobody. Um, but the, you know you have these really weird things happen. I had this one guy literally message me out of the blue. I'm not gonna say his name, but he messaged me. This was a couple weeks ago, and uh, it was it was just this really weird conversation. Weird in the sense that you know he was like, I cannot believe we're talking right now, and I just wanted to tell you that your your films helped me through a really tough time in my life, and it's an amazing thing to hear. But at the same time, I'm just some guy. Like I told him, I'm. I'm just some guy. I'm not Tom Cruise. You know, I don't, I don't feel like I've achieved that level, but he's telling me that my name is really well known in horror circles in Canada and all this, and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's really interesting. So, you know, and, and the other funny thing too, is like part of this started, you know, there's, it's, it's complicated, you sure, know, it's, it's never, sure. it's never one thing sure. that it's never one simple thing that just like, I'm going to do this. And this yeah. is but like when I was working at the TV station, I had to do some shoot and it took me to a cemetery and I was going through the cemetery and I was looking at all these really old tombstones, people who'd been dead for like a hundred years. And it made me really sad because I thought, this person had dreams. He had, you know, he, she, they had hopes. You know, what were they like? What was their personality? What jokes did they tell? And what annoying traits did they have? You know, that kind of a thing. Did they leave a mark? And then it hit me out and I thought, man, one day I'm going to be this random tombstone in a cemetery somewhere. Am I going to leave? What mark am I going to leave behind? And, you know, granted, I have my kids and you know, I, I love them dearly and I, you know, I can't wait to see them grow up and, and you know, that, that of course your lineage precedes you and, and they go on. And, but I mean, even a hundred years from now, is my family ever going to know that I existed? So I, I was thinking about that, like that far ahead, you know, in a hundred years, will the generations that, that follow me, will they know who I was? And maybe it doesn't matter that they does it does it really matter that they know who I am? It really doesn't. But it just I was like I don't want to be forgotten. And honestly, death is kind of my greatest fear, which sucks because that's going to happen no matter no matter how much I don't want it to happen. It's going to happen. Hopefully not right now on the show. That would be yeah, no. Uh, but hey, this would be around for people to watch and remember, and I, it might might become viral at that point. But. Well, but that's to to pick up your point. Um, we have a gift, the gift of technology to share our vision, to share our content, to share whatever we want. Um, I had a, a not a similar experience by a um, cemetery, but I woke up on my thirtieth birthday with a hangover, not from alcohol, but just emotional. Like, what have I done? Like, I sat at the end of a bed. And I was like, what, what have I done? What have I contributed? What have I done? What, what, if you, and, and I hate, this sounds really pretentious right now, but you Google my name, what are they going to find? Some Twitter post of me making fun of a baseball game or, you know, uh, cause you know, we all have, everybody has uh, baseball rivals and, you know, sports rivals, you know, are they going to find some picture that I took of, um, of a movie poster or, are they going to find me fanning out over something that I've created and selfishly pushed in your face? Are they going to find documentation of me helping somebody? Like I want to look back and I want to say that even if I got one shot, I got to take people with me. Like I really do because not, not similar to you in the sense of someone reaching out and saying you, you changed my life. Like for me, it's, um, I look at it and I'm just like, if I stood on a platform and screamed whatever I wanted to and shared a message, not only would it be um, selfish just because it's motivated by me, but how dare me borrow your headspace? If you're going to give me attention for longer, longer than 30 seconds, then it's got to be great. 
And why would I be selfish with it? And why would I say this is my agenda and my passion and my, my vision? Why wouldn't I just grab somebody and say, this person's doing really awesome stuff and I'd like to introduce you to them. And that's the whole mission by the Lincoln's Legends brand. Like I, I, we can all be our own legend if we want to, but we have to build a legacy and it's going to take your entire life to do it. And it's going to take every conversation and every smile and every frown, but we can all do it together. And essentially we can create our own footprint and our own stamp and, and we can control it. I, I know that we live in a world where people are digesting celebrities like they're, you know, Tic Tacs and they're so obsessed with these people that they'll never meet. And those people do not care about you. But I've got just volumes as a play on words of conversations with people that are just the the top of their game whether it's the guy that created post secret or someone that gets to run a, a, a charity breakfast at, at skywalker ranch like these people are from your backyard and you have no idea who they are but you spend hours and hours of your life that you're never going to get back obsessing over someone's youtube video they didn't even know Gah! there's people here that you can fan out on that are just as important, and, and they're there. They deserve the attention just as much as everybody else. So, I guess that's my that's my soapbox. If I could stand on a soapbox, I would say, check out these people. They're doing awesome stuff. And there's this guy from from Owensboro that just basically took the horror genre by storm and went to a library and pitched this stuff. And I can tell you, but it's not my story, and that's why we're hanging out. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah it's, and, and see, that's and that's the thing. It's like there's, in my opinion, some of the best films that are being made right now are coming from the independent world. Well, sure. Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the, even some of the, you know, the straight to video stuff that that you see at family video and you know on video on demand. I mean, I mean here recently, just for instance. Um, Victor Matthew put out the monster project and of course, you know, I mean, it did really well. It was like the number one trailer on IMDb and that kind of a thing, but it's an independent film and it's fantastic. It's one of the best shot on video found footage type movies that I've seen in a while. It's got one of those badass werewolves that I've seen in quite some time, you know? So it's, it's, but I mean, there's, there's still some good theatrical movies being made. But I think some of the some of the, the the films that truly have the best stories or the best characters or the most heart or you can see the most amount of passion being put into it has been coming from from you know people at at my level or or even people just you know I just that's I mean those those are the people that are making the films that I care about most and that's another reason. Like all these earlier, you made the comment that I've, I'm producing so many projects, and that's the reason why I'm doing it. Sure. I mean, one absolutely over the since 2007 till now, over the last decade, um, I've managed to garner quite a few media contacts. So one of the things that I, I've really gotten to be fairly decent at is marketing and promotions, which also happens to be one of the, the most taxing. And, and difficult areas to really just, you know dive headfirst into when you're making your films. So I'm getting I've been introduced to some of these filmmakers or I, I worked with some of them on volumes of blood horror stories and they saw what I was capable of or I talked to them about their projects and got to asking them about you know what they were planning on doing with it, and where they were planning on going with it and some of them didn't really know, exactly where they were going to take it or what they were going to do with it next or how to get it at that next level media step. So that's, that's what I did. I'm, I'm coming on to these projects and, and helping them out as much as I can, because I mean, these, these films that are being made, I mean, they're, they're, I, for instance, um, close calls is one that I helped produce. I kind of, I, I came on in the very tail end of production and I just I just got a chance to watch it. It's getting ready to have its premiere. And I mean it's it is a really solid seventies, eighties kind of a throwback. It's got all kind it's got these really interesting and weird and quirky characters. And it's it's horror, but it's it's more it's a thriller. It's kind of all over the place. And I really just got a, a chance to watch it. And I mean it's 
the acting is solid, and the, the writing is solid, and I mean, it's it's just started getting into festivals and things, but I'm, I'm excited to be helping out these filmmakers like Richard Stringham or Rocky Gray, Justin Seaman and Zane Hirschberger and all these individuals. Like, I mean, they're, they're friends now, but at the same time, yeah. it's like, you know, they're doing what I consider to be some of the most interesting projects that are happening. And a lot of them, of course, are, are in the horror area. Um, but, but, you know, by helping them out, of course, that's also opening up more doors and, and more networking opportunities and it's given me a chance to to meet some more really cool and interesting people and and um i don't know it's just it's just a really exciting time right now it's probably the most the most busy and active i've i've really been in a long time but i i was telling somebody yesterday or the day before that even if all this ended tomorrow i could still look back and, and say, here are all the neat things that I did and I were a part of. And I and I think I've produced t- like 20 some odd projects at this awesome. point. That's so, awesome. I mean, that's, that's 20 that's projects awesome. that will exist somewhere out in the stratosphere for eternity, for that's, as long as the internet lasts or as long as dreams. media lasts. It's yeah. just, you know, they'll be out there. So a hundred years from now, yeah. those, those <laughs> unknown family members that I was talking about that I'll never get a chance to meet will have an opportunity to be able to look back and watch things like this, things that you're doing, allowing people and not just me, but all these people that you're going to talk to, they'll be able to look back and see their family members and what some of their family members did or were, were a part of or what they were capable of. And, and it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just a really awesome thing. Let's uh, let's pause uh, soon because uh, you've let me borrow a lot of your time and I appreciate it. Um, I would say pause because I feel that if you have a conversation in the correct way that it really shouldn't end, um, so there's always more to say and more to visit, more to do. Um, let's give the, uh, I guess, the formal plugs of where everything can be checked out. Uh, you know, the thing that you're most excited about moving forward, um, this is going to air in a few weeks. So I don't know if there's anything time sensitive. Um, I I try really hard not to do time sensitive content because I don't want it to be clickbait. I don't, I want it to be origin and, and have weight. And I, I want it to be, I want someone to come and visit the store because they want to be there. Not because they're just trying to get something and get out. I think that's a, it's an epidemic of clickbait right now. So if there's anything that you're just super pumped about that you want to say, hey, you know, this is coming down the pipe, uh, and then just give the social plugs and we'll wrap it up. And I just I can't thank you enough for letting me, you know, borrow your headspace. And and now I get to share this with so many other people and, and I get to use our conversation as an example of if you want to do something, get out and do it. It's the the groundwork is already there. There is a foundation. If you want it bad enough, you can take it because you're a living example of doing that. So. Thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. Um, I mean, like right. Well, as as far as projects are concerned, uh, right now we are in early development on Volumes of Blood three, so it is going to be a trilogy. It is going to be the final installment. Uh, we won't start shooting till next year. But the but the cool thing is is um, we've partnered with Petrie Entertainment. They're the same ones that have distributed Volumes of Blood horror stories, and. Uh, and of course, you can get that on DVD and Blu-ray and video on demand right now. And uh, but we've partnered with them on the third film, so we're really looking at, at taking it to a much larger level to finish out the uh, the overall story arc that's happening. Um, another project I'm working on is called Angel from Tory Jones. He made the Wicked One, and uh, they just had a big production meeting. And a read through with the cast, which unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond my control, was not able to be there. But uh, from what he told me today, he said, you know, that it went really well. And and of course, they did live casting and some special effects uh, prep and stuff like that. Um, another one I I was executive producer on is called Butcher the Bakers, directed by Tyler Am from Hometown Heroes. They're out of Ottawa, Illinois, 
and they they are definitely a a group to keep to keep watch of because they have three films that are going to be releasing through Petri Entertainment. Um, but Butcher the Bakers was the one that I was directly attached to, and uh, I mean th- their stuff really reminds me of, of Kevin Smith. And his, I mean, it really harkens back to what, so what awesome. Kevin Smith did in, or his, in his early career. And I mean, the, the comedy is on spot and the acting is just solid across the board. It's, it's got this really zany concept for Butcher the Bakers, so I cannot wait for that one to come out. Um, Gnawbone is another one that I'm working on. It's a throwback to the the. the the days of um, like men in rubber suits, that type of a monster. Oh, movie. okay, all right. Yeah, I love I love monster <laughs> That's movies. That's awesome. It's, it's directed by Darren Means, and you know he sold me on the concept because it, it, for him it was a passion project. Sure. It was his first feature film that he directed, and uh, it kind of goes back into what you'd said earlier. Like they 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 finished the film, and then they weren't entirely sure where to take it or what to do with it. And he and I got connected and, and we started talking and, and then I came on board the project to kind of help get it out there and see, but it's, it's, I mean, it's really well done. And I mean, it does, it's a great throwback to those, those days of, you know, men in rubber monster suits and they just did such a great job. And, um, 1031 is another one that I'm uh, producing. It's a, it's a, it's a Halloween themed horror anthology and it's, it was created by Rocky Gray. Who's uh, he's a musician. He was the former drummer for Evanescence and he did the score for volumes of blood horror stories, awesome. super talented wow. guy. And yeah. of course it's got, uh, you know, Brett Dieger who did bone jangles is attached to it. And Justin Seaman who worked on, he did the barn. I don't know if you're familiar with the barn or not, but I mean, it made huge waves in the independent there's film. There's going to be like, a lot of people that are just like booing me right now and I'm very sorry. I apologize. No, 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 like, you no, don't no, know the no, no, no. I'm sorry. You should check it out. I, mean, I will. It's absolutely. Cool. I got to watch with the lights on though because I'm scared it's, again. So I have well, to. It's, just, it's, it is, uh, it's kind of a throwback too. The Barn is. It's okay. a throwback. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's a fun movie. It's, it's, it's definitely one that you need to check out. Um, yeah. And then, then there's another film that actually that same group is doing, and I'm on board that project as well. It's called Cryptids, and it too, it's a, it's a uh, anthology creature feature. So, but it, it's monsters that you don't normally hear about or see in films. Uh, you know, like the Dover Demon. It's those types of monsters. It's ones that are are known, but maybe not well known. And that that was one of the things that really sold me on that project was, was the, uh, the fact that they were doing a monster movie, but at the same time, it was, it was, a, it wasn't your atypical run of the mill. It wasn't just Bigfoot. It wasn't just that it was, it was other creatures that maybe you have or haven't heard of. And of course they're bringing those, those monsters to life and doing some really cool things with them. to work with do you have a Mosher we mentioned Kevin Smith a uh, hundred times throughout this podcast do you have a Scott Mosher that you won't make a movie without yes I do uh, his name is Eric Huskison and I, I met him um, actually while I was doing Unscripted we did a zombie night and he he showed up completely decked out in zombie attire and he and I got to talking and, and actually he, he came to a couple different ones and I'm not really I'm not really sure which one it was, but he did win, and he was also the only adult standing up in front of everyone, and uh, it was him and like four kids. He committed to the bit. He was committed. Yeah, he he uh, he he literally feels like he stole candy from a baby. But uh, but anyway, um, so he and I we we started kind of hanging out. We became friends, fast friends, and uh, and he helped out with the that WBKR zombie video that I've talked about before. And then he ended up coming on and being 
full on with volumes of blood. Like he really jumped in head first, was ready to help out with, with anything and everything. And, um, so he and I just became like really, really good super friends. And, and then he came on and helped with Scarefest. And of course, uh, by the time we got to volumes of blood horror stories, I mean, he was, he was all in. And, you know, one of the, I'm always talking about how, even if it's just a little bit, you, you need to take your next project, uh, to, to the very next level if you can. And for us, that was partnering together and creating Blood Moon Pictures. And that's what we did. So Volumes of Blood Horror Stories is the first project under the new production company. And that's, of course, that's Eric and myself. And, um, I mean, where, where I lack in business sense and all that, I mean, Eric is that's where he excels. I mean, he's fantastic with numbers and, and of course he's creative too. So, and it's just, it's just, it's, it's a really good and it's a really strong partnership. And it's honestly one of the, the, the best partnerships that, that I've, that I've had up to this point, because I've had some partners in the past that I worked with and they didn't particularly pull their weight. Um, they were ready to take credit for the project, but maybe they weren't, they're all in entirely for production or whatever it may be. A lot of that fell into my shoulders, but then when it came time to get the kudos, they were ready to be there. And Eric's not like that at all. Eric's there day one. He's one of the last guys to leave. So he deserves just as much credit as, as me or anybody else that's directly involved with the project. So yeah, so Eric and I have, uh, have created Blood Moon Pictures and, and that's going forward into the future. That's all the films that we do all these little side projects we have, like we have a tabletop card game for the volumes of blood universe. We may or may not have maybe a graphic novel in the works. I don't know. And uh, so it's like all those things are, are, is, are us partnering with do what? Screener copies. Remember the little people. That's all. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I can't thank you enough. I want to keep the conversation going. Because I want to be able to to be in a circle of horror and say, hey, if you really are committed to your craft and we can't find anybody locally, that I've got a guy that I can introduce you to, and we can, you know, we can keep your mission alive. And, and I'm really excited about that. So I can't thank you enough for taking the time. This will be up in a couple of weeks, and you're just awesome. Thanks for for being on the show. Yeah.